Hi, Holly from Edison Ford Winter Estates Program Manager. This topic is about the ringlings of Sarasota. It's probably the most research I think I've ever done on a topic. And even then there's so much more to know that you can't adequately cover it in a PowerPoint presentation that's about one hour long. But let's get started. Thank you for joining me. The ringlings of Sarasota. And that is when the circus uh, was in Sarasota in the late 1920s on. Uh, John Bringling brought them there. I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but their winter quarters started there. Here is the Ringling children. Augustus Rungling, I'm probably saying that wrong because this is, um, my German accent is not correct. And Marie Salome Juilliard met in Milwaukee in 1852. The family then lived in McGregor, Iowa, but they moved to Baraboo, Wisconsin. And that's where people really know them being from. And when the brothers were still young, Augustus Rungling worked as a saddle and harness maker and his family who immigrated from Germany changed their last name to Ringling when they settled in Baraboo permanently. They had eight children, Albert, Augustus, Otto, Alfred, Charles, John, Henry, and, they and then they had Ida, their one and only girl, the youngest. The Ringling Brothers Circus was founded by five of the Ringling Brothers, Albert C. And you can see the dates of their birth and their death there. Otto, Albert T, Alfred T, and they, they had to uh, differentiate by calling one of them Al T and the other one was Albert, Al. So uh, that got a little tricky. And then there was Charles and John. According to one of the Ringling brothers, they were able to watch the circus for the first time using free passes. A man named Andrew Gaffney brought some items for August to complete repair and when he refused payment Gaffney gave August circus tickets for his entire family instead. Gaffney was a cannonball juggler and strong man who performed for John Stowe's circus. After the viewing the performance the Ringley brothers honed their skills in hopes of one day becoming performers in the circus. The only problem with that is that there is another story and they were two reliable sources so I'm going to tell you both of them. Uh, one of them I watched on a a video, a PBS video. Uh, the other one was in a, a book that's well documented as well. The other possible story of the beginning is in the spring of 1870, Dan Rice's Great Paris Pavilion Circus, a riverboat show, docked in McGregor and began to unload. The Ringling's sons were there to watch. After seeing the performance, the boys were hooked. I think that it was more likely the first one because it's in Baraboo, but who knows? I'm not, I can't say with absolute certainty which story is true. And over here, you can see where it's labeled John Ringling. That's John Ringling. Charles, Albert, Otto, Alfred, and John formed a song and dance troupe and concert co company, and they went on the road with it for two seasons. So they weren't exactly circus performers. They were kind of traveling with song and musical instruments. And they began, began to add circus acts to, because, to their show because people weren't really coming out to see them sing or play an instrument or even dance. Uh, and they organized their first small circus, which opened on May 19, 1884, of their hometown of Baraboo. They had a wagon, a rented horse, and partnered with an experienced showman named Yankee Robinson. The Ringlings opened their first circus on May 19, 1884. Unfortunately, Robinson died before the end of the first year, and the Ringlings became the sole owners. And John is the third one down here, by the way, but you probably are going to be able to pick him out. They had their own donkey and a Shetland pony and the start of their first trick act. By 1887, its official title was Ringling Brothers United Monster Shows, Great Double Circus, Royal European Menagerie, Museum, Caravan, and Congress of Trained Animals. The circus grew, initially grew, fortunately, the, uh, slowly. Fortunately, the brothers had divided the management by tasks that suited their personalities. Each brother had a specialty. Alf T did publicity, 
Gus arranged the advertising. Al picked the acts. He was the only true performer and was the ringmaster. And his wife, Louise, was a talented equestrian and the only wife who was a performer. And this is all leading up to them getting to Sarasota, the ones that settled there. I just wanted to give you a little background. Charles produced the show, though he had begun as a self-taught musician playing in the band. Otto managed the money and John, the one that we're gonna focus on the most, supervised transportation. He went ahead some and set things up. It was John's skillful routing of the circus that allowed them to avoid direct clashes with their competitors and to grow their audience in small or neglected towns. He quickly gave up his act as a Dutch clown. And in other places I've read a Dutch singing cl clown. So that's all I know about that. Uh, exactly what a Dutch clown means. Is it supposed to be someone who's as though they were from the Netherlands? I'm not quite sure. I did try to find an answer, but I did not. In 1895, the brothers decided to travel to New England, which had been the stronghold of the powerful Barnum and Bailey Circus. These two circuses agreed to divide the U.S. rather than compete head to head. The Ringlings established their headquarters in Chicago while Barnum and Bailey stayed in New York. Neither would intrude on the other's region. By 1900, the Ringling brothers had one of the largest traveling shows and began buying other circuses. After James Bailey died in 1907, and yes, P.T. Barnum had long since passed away, the Ringlings bought the Barnum and Bailey Circus, their largest competitor but kept them as two separate circuses. By 1910, the Ringling Brothers Circus had more than a thousand employees, 335 horses, 26 elephants, 16 camels, and other assorted animals that traveled on 92 rail cars because they weren't going to go by horse-drawn or whatever kind of animal-drawn wagon anymore. The Barnum and Bailey Circus was about the same size. So they are running two circuses. When the U.S. entered World War I, audiences decreased and many employees joined the military. So the Ringlings combined two into the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey combined shows. And you all know this part, the greatest show on earth. And it was also much more practical and much more affordable for them just to have one show. They traveled in 90 to 100 double length train cars. By the time Charles and John were the only two surviving brothers of the five who founded the circus. And realize there's a big age gap from the oldest to the youngest child there. But they, they really didn't, most of them survived to like um, uh, advanced age at that time. After Charles' death in 1926, John will run the circus empire alone for 10 years. In 1929, John Ringling purchased the American Circus Corporation, a conglomeration of five major shows. And that, some people, also is going to contribute to John's financial demise. And I just put one of these posters up here because I thought, that they are beautiful and there's a lot of circus posters. And if you go to visit the Ringling Museum, which I hope you do in uh, Sarasota, you will see some of those there. And by the way, I forgot to tell you where I was. I'm in front of Cotizan, which is the house of John in Sarasota, Florida, but this isn't how they started out. Um, are we having any issues with you hearing me? Okay. Well, let's go back up here. Born with the, um, Armil, the, the name Armilda Burton, Mabel Ringling. And I love this picture of her. I think she's gorgeous. Mabel Ringling was a woman of humble background. She was born on March 14th, 1875 on a farm in Moons, Ohio. She was one of five daughters and the son of John Wesley and Mary Elizabeth Burton. By the beginning of the 20th century, she left Ohio. And I wanna tell you, I take my research very seriously, 
but there is so much conflicting information. And the true answer is we don't know 100% for sure how she and John met. Uh, and I try to use reliable sources. Uh, there are many stories that describe how she and John met, it's, but it's uncertain even where they met. One tale is that while working in New Jersey, she met John in Atlantic City. Another is that Mabel was working as a cashier in a restaurant in Chicago where she met John. And that was um, a ring um, video on PBS, uh, I think filmed in Sarasota about, or sponsored by that station about John and Mabel's history. And of course you remember their headquarters were in Chicago for a while. And from the books, the Circus Kings are Ringling Story by Henry Ringling North and Alden Hatch and that is John's nephew. In 1903, at 37 years of age, John Ringling had finally married his bride, Mabel Burton of Columbus, Ohio, who's in her 20s. She and her sister were dancers and one of the great specks of the circus. Though John Ringling would never trifle with the performers, he could and did completely fall in love with one. Marriage was different. So you can see, conflicting information here. But what we do know, and, and perhaps it's a different time, they don't want the whole world to know how they met. It's not like People Magazine, TMZ, Entertainment Tonight was around then. They married on December 29th, 1905. She was 30 and he was 39. In 1909, John and Mabel visited Sarasota. And my grandmother's name was Mabel and I found a, a spelling of her name, interesting, because typically you see Mabel, M-A-B-E-L. And when I was watching that video, uh, the PBS video online, I saw that they showed a copy of a marriage certificate. Whether this was an original or not, it sure looked like it, but I didn't get a chance to uh, find out if it was. It looked like it was spelled M-A-B-E-L. So I don't know if she chose one spelling and then switched it to make it unique but it, that's what she goes with in later years. In 1911, they bought their first home there. Mabel maintained strong ties with her family who visited Sarasota often. And this is a picture of them uh, shortly after that time period traveling with the circus, which they did a fair amount over the years, especially John, but Mabel would often go with him. There's another picture of her. And this is their first home. In 1911, the Ringlings purchased 20 acres of land on Sarasota Bay with a 12 room home called Palms Elysian. Mabel Ringling had reconfigured the rooms by enlarging them and installed indoor plumbing. John and Mabel spent winter, spending winters in Sarasota. Uh, and in the 1920s, they purchased more real estate. And actually this is going to be the same site where Cotizan and their whole estate will be. John and Charles Ringling owned at one time more than 25% of the total area of Sarasota, hoping to develop a tourist resort. Ringling had not yet come to Sarasota, had not come to Sarasota because of the land boom. Uh, because I believe in the early 1900s up uh, till a little past that, it was only about 800 something people and it was a small fishing village. They came here for respite and the real estate boom changed everything for the Ringlings. And that's gonna be their home uh, before Cotizan. And you can see it's heavily landscaped and it's Palms Elysian. And it's, it's a linen postcard that says John Ringling's winter home. Ringling became interested in real estate development in Florida. And when Ringling was not in Sarasota, he left Owen Burns, a major developer in charge to ensure that Ringling's projects were completed along with his own. And they also became partners on some projects. Their largest project was Ringling Estates on Ringling Isles, which included St. Armand's Key. I'm sure you all have heard of that. Coon Key, Wolf Key, and 2,000 acres on Longboat Key. Those keys are a big, uh, um, pretty significant to Sarasota. 
It had some difficult components. It needed to be dredged, filled, and landscaped. Adjoining parcels of property throughout the area from different owners needed to be purchased without driving up the price. A long bridge to span Sarasota Bay was required to allow traffic to reach the development. There was also the construction of a world-class Ritz-Carlton Hotel with a golf course. All this required hundreds of workers. And Ringling and Owen Burns uh, were partners in some businesses, some things they were separated on. And there was a lot of back and forth and talk about how fair it was were they equal partners? How much money uh, went into it? A long bridge was, uh, they wanted to drive up, not drive up the price of land. So they created this long bridge to span Sarasota Bay, which was a, re required to allow traffic to reach the development. There was also that world-class Ritz-Carlton Hotel with the golf course. And all this required hundreds of workers on January 1st, 1926, what happens? John Ringling makes his first trip across the causeway with his chauffeur at the wheel. It was reported to have cost between three quarters of a million and a million dollars for Ringling. February 27th, 1926, the public got their chance to take uh, the trip across Sarasota Bay. That first day totaled 4,000 autos and 10,000 people visiting the aisles. Ringling also ran buses from his Main Street office every hour, and more Sarasotans had never seen anything like these European style boulevards, canals, palm trees, and parkways. But there's going to be a falling out. Two men that had worked in partnership together, this partnership is going to fall apart. And there's going to be a lot of bad feelings and lawsuits that take place here. John Ringling, by May, September of 1926, only nine months after the opening, it marked the end of the boom. And John Ringling is developing this area where they had to dredge and fill all those that area in the Keys. The local land market crashed, followed by the Great Depression and World War II. The partnership dissolved for financial reasons, Owen Burns and John Ringling. The Ritz-Carlton stood unfinished one month before completion, one month away, think about that, until it was torn down in the 1960s. Ringling poured an estimated 650,000, some of which was shared assets with Burns. And putting that money in today's time, money of today's time would be a lot more. And it didn't leave good feelings. Those shared assets with Burns were put into the hotel and they were never able to see the project through. Following Ringling's death in 1936, Martin Sweeney of New York expressed interest in finishing the hotel, but the plan failed to materialize. After changing hands several more times over the decades, the incomplete building, and I have it here for you, and it's really seemed like it was fairly close to being done. The incomplete building was finally demolished in 1964, which is so sad. And standing this location currently is the Longboat Key Club Resort. So it took many years to tear this down. And this part was particularly left undone over here. Here's another building that John Ringling had influence on. It's designed by Dwight James Baum and constructed by the Burns Construction Company. From the beginning, the hotel was the center of glamor and activity in Sarasota. Although constructed by Owen Burns, a Sarasota real estate developer, and you'll hear there's, you've heard that name before because they're in a partnership and it ends up going to court and it doesn't end well for either one of them. They were partners. They help um, bomb helping Kadazan. From beginning, the hotel was the center of glamour and activity in Sarasota. And it's called the El Verona and later on the John Ringling Hotel. Although constructed by Owen Burns, a Sarasota real, Sarasota real estate developer, 
John Ringling purchased the property four years after it opened. Ringling changed the name and management of the hotel, but it remained a posh destination for the wealthy and elite. After Ringling's death in 1936, his nephew, John Ringling North, introduced a circus theme to the hotel. So it's gonna close and reopen and that's when he's gonna have circuits acts in the hotel. It's not the part that's remaining uh, that needs to be torn down many years later. Um, it's another hotel that had fully opened and then eventually it will be run by John Ringling North years later and has a circus theme Trapeze artist, aerialist swung from ropes tied to wooden beams just in a hotel in the dining room during the heyday of the hotel in the 1940s and 19, early 1950s. Now realize by this time, John Ringling has passed away. The ho hotel closed around 1957 and it was converted to apartments and reopened in 1964 and no more swinging through the hallways. It closed again in 1980 and remained vacant for 18 years. After numerous unsuccessful attempts to rehabilitate the building, it was demolished in June of 1998. And there's a copy of it uh, in the 1920s. And a lot of these pictures, I should tell you, um, come from the Library of Congress. So that's one of them here. And the other ones is the Florida Memory Project. And remember, John Ringling North, uh, years later, is going to introduce that circus theme until the early 1950s, and then it's turned into apartments. And John Ringling, the John Ringling statue on St. Armand's Circle was acquired by the city of Sarasota. And I got this from the Sarasota Arts uh, website, the John Ringling statue, Sarasota Public Art. It was acquired by the city of Sarasota in 2001 was created by a Cuban sculptor, Tony Lopez, and this figure, figure stands on the southern side of St. Armand's Circle. You're very familiar with that area today, and back then known as St. Armand's Key, where it overlooks the realization of John's vision. When John purchased the key in 1924, he envisioned a development that included shopping, restaurants, homes, and art. Oh, the Great Depression prevented him from seeing this dream become a reality. Remember that hotel got torn down. The area didn't get to develop all the shops and everything that he wanted. But that John Ringling Causeway, by the way, it, uh, remains. It's been rebuilt a couple of times, but it is named after him. In 1945, the development was resurrected and John's island community is still enjoying to, enjoyed to this day, but he never got to see that happen. In 2001, Harding Circle was added to the National Register of Historic Places. John's original vision included a winter residence for the President of the United States, and that would happen to be Warren G. Harding, which inspired the street names and the original name for the circle, which is called Harding Circle. Warren G. Harding actually traveled uh, with the Edisons once on camping trips, the Edison Ford Firestone and Warren G. Harding, the President of the United States, joined them for a bit on that camping trip. And Ringling here uh, wants to pay tribute to Warren G. Harding and actually wanted him, was hoping to build a home that he could live there. Keep that in the back of your mind. And I'm gonna move myself over here for a minute. Well, the Ringling Circus was at the height of its popularity. And John had moved to Sarasota at Palms Elysian. And Charles and his wife, Edith Ringling, fell in love with Sarasota and moved into a house. In 1925, Charles built a Georgia pink mansion on 40 acres on the bayfront near John and Mabel's home. His daughter, Hester, lived in her home with her family immediately to uh, the north of um, the Ringling's home. And his son, Robert, in later years, when his health was poor, actually had a small home uh, near his mother's home uh, at the end of his life as well. 
Hester Ringling North uh, Hester Ringling Patterson Sanford remained in her home until her death in 1964. It's now part of the new college campus called South Hall. Charles Ringling only spent a few months in the house after occupying it in March of 1926. He died of a cerebral hemorrhage in December of 1926. And this is their home. I'm gonna show you a little more and tell you a little more about it. And one of the things I have learned is that John Ringling was not permitted at his brother's bedside apparently um, as he's dying because there's some family disputes going on. This is a postcard. It says the Charles Ringling residence, Sarasota, Florida. Edith Ringling lived in the house until her death in 1953. She is fondly remembered for re reimbursing depositors completely for her own money after Charles's bank failed during the Great Depression. And apparently she uh, took up to, it was up to $250,000 that came out of her own pocket. So she was thought quite highly of in Sarasota for doing that. After her death, when her children could not afford to ma maintain the mansion, it was purchased by Jerry Collins, an owner of the Sarasota Kennel Club, along with 30 acres in 1958. Collins paid off the county property tax liens and then sold it to Fred Winans, who spent $100,000 on repairs and restoration. New College, founded in 1960, bought the estate two years later for $4 million. Today, the building is known as College Hall, and it has a basement and five fireplaces. John Ringling had enough marble barge to the site for both Cotizan and the Charles Ringling Mansion. A team of artisans worked on both homes. John Ringling installed Florida's first residential elevator in Cadizan, and Charles Ringling had one as well, but it has since been removed. So you would not find it there today. Uh, and so that is on the grounds of New College. The Aeolian organ in the music room cost $32,500. The organ had 2,520 pipes and Charles Ringling's son was an opera singer and his daughter, a local theater performer and they appreciated the music there. While in Sarasota, Charles Ringling purchased land and donated significant parcels to the newly created county. He, uh, he developed the 10 story Sarasota Terrace Hotel and 150 Spanish style homes. He founded the Ringling Bank. I remember his wife, Edith, will pay off any debt when the bank fails. And he donated land for a courthouse for the newly created Sarasota County. Ringling Boulevard, the street between the courthouse and his hotel, is named for Charles Ringling. I'm going to move myself back over here. And there is another view of Charles's home right near the Ringling home, except it's um, owned by the new college. A little more information about the Ringling family. Ida Ringling was the only sister and the youngest of the family. When she's 28, she marries a man twice her age, Harry Whitestone North. He was divorced with a daughter the same age as Ida. They had three children, John, Mary Salome and Henry. During the last years of John Ringling's life, he broke off all contact with Ida and her two sons. And there are uh, disputes within the family, but they also were very close at certain times. So I don't have an exact answer from why they were estranged at the end of their life. There's a lot of guesstimation. So Ida moves into Bird Key, a place called New Edsel Castle, after John Ringling's death, he owned it, by the way, in 1936. And other family members, his nephew, Richard, who was supposedly um, his favorite nephew, uh, lived there. And then when he passes away, his widow lives there. And then eventually, Ida lives there. And she lived there till her death in 1950. And then on the left, we have Henry Ringling North, the vice president of the circus. Ida Ringling North, and she's the mother of John and Henry. 
John Ringley North, the circus president, 1937 to 1943 and 1947 to 1967. And this is from the Florida Memory Project. And it says, seen at the winter quarters as the train is about to depart for the opening at Madison Square Garden in New York. And there is Henry Ringling North, Ida, and John Ringling North here. And by the way, John Ringling was also one of the developers of the original uh, Madison Square Garden as well. And you know that that was a place when they go from being under the tents uh, that they would have their circus start. Many times uh, it would start at Madison Square Garden. Now here's the Ringling's yacht. It's obviously not on land there. So in 1922, John Ringling purchased a 125 foot yacht. He named Zalophus. He would entertain friends and potential financial investors there. And on February 4th, 1930, so this is after his wife Mabel died, while Ringling was out of town, the circus general manager, Samuel Gumperts, borrowed the yacht to go to Yuseppa Island. And you know, Yuseppa isn't that far away from us um, in South, way down in Southwest Florida here. At 3 a.m., the heavy all steel yacht struck, struck an object near Lido Key and it sank in 12 feet of water. A statement declared four passengers on board but it was later discovered that Jimmy Walker, the mayor of New York, and his friend, actress Betty Compton, were taken to Fort Myers to avoid the press. And we'll just leave that one there. Um, I would think John Ringling would have been upset that it, the yacht was borrowed and sunk. In 1925, John Ringling was on the cover of Time magazine, which named him as the 13th wealthiest man in America. Now, I don't know if this is cash or this is what his investments are worth. But his investments, he was certainly comfortable at the time. His investments included, besides the circus, ranching, oil, real estate, and the railroad. And in 1923, John also founded a bank, the Bank of Sarasota, and was on the board of directors of the Ringling Bank and Trust, his brother Charles's bank. New York architect James Baum designed Cotazon, which means the house of John in the Venetian dialect, it, which John and Mabel had visited Italy and they were very interested in that area. And they had done a lot of purchasing, including a purchasing of art over the years. It took only two years for Owen Burns. You remember that name from when they are uh, partners um, on some developing there? He's the one that constructed this beautiful home and is crewed to complete at a cost of 1.5 million. It is built in the style of Italy's Venetian Gothic palaces using fine materials, including colored marble, glazed terracotta and stained glass. Mabel, who had kept an oilskin portfolio filled with postcards, sketches and photos she had collected during her travels, oversaw every aspect of the construction. And if you've ever had anything built, you know that that's a lot of work from the, from the mixing of the terracotta to the glazing of the tiles. Indeed, her involvement was so great that the original architectural plans called it the residence of Mrs. John Ring. Now, it didn't say Mabel Ringling because that is how women were referred to frequently during that time period with their husband's uh, name, but that was referred to as her home. Cotazon is 36,000 square feet and has 56 rooms. The Ringlings had been traveling through Europe for nearly 25 years, so I'm being redundant here, but they acquired circus acts, but they also acquired art. And here's an early postcard of it. And uh, is, is it not lovely? 
And uh, some of this, I went to the Ringling has a great website. And uh, I, a lot of this, this part is from their site. The 36,000 square, and as you can see, the history of Katazan, ringling.org backslash Katazan. The 36,000 square foot home sits on a waterfront site, 1,000 feet long and 3,000 feet deep. It's five stories tall and has a full basement. It's constructed from terracotta tea blocks, concrete and brick. It's covered with stucco, terracotta, embellished with glazed tile, decorative decorative tile medallions, oh, I, I could go, balustrades and ornamental cresting and soft red, yellow, green, blue and ivory highlight the pink patina of the stucco and terracotta exterior. Originally roofed with 16th century Spanish tiles imported by the builder, the bayfront terrace was made from domestic and imported marble and Ringling kept his yacht. Remember, I just told you about that dock there and often entertains celebrities of the Roaring Twenties, including comedian Will Rogers and New York Mayor Jimmy Walker. And we also know that he was involved with that yacht accident. There was also Florence Ziegfeld who did a lot of those movies with uh, a lot of spectacular numbers and his wife, the actress, uh, Billy Burke, who I believe mm, uh, might've been in The Wizard of Oz. Um, inside the main floor included living, entertaining, and dining areas. The Ringling's private bedrooms, as well as five guest bedrooms, are found on the second floor along with the servants' quarters. On the third floor, there's a game room and a bath. On the fourth floor, there's a great bean guest room and a bath with windows on all four sides. At the property's pinnacle is an 82-foot 82 foot high tire tower. You can see it with open air landing and high dome ceiling. Legend has it that John enjoyed taking guests up to the tower to show them his land holdings in Sarasota, Sarasota, which then extended nearly as far as the eye could see. Another story I read said that he liked to take children up there and have, let them have milk and cookies up there, which would be a thrill. Um, and this is also from their site. I want to give them credit. Uh, Katazan, this is some pictures of the interior. Um, is it every bit as opulent inside as it is out? There's paintings by Zanchi Sorin, and I can't say that last name, and they hang on the walls, displayed in the smaller butchers, butler's pantry is a collection of silver that was used during formal events. A much larger pantry has custom made a German silver sink that provided a soft service to protect the fine crystal china and earthenware from breakage. The cabinetry throughout the pantry displays the extensive collection of china collected during the Ringling's world travels. The dining table accommodates 22 chairs. A crystal chandelier from the original Waldorf Astoria hangs in the living room above a black and white marble tile floor. And I could have put I have a lot of pictures I've taken myself. I didn't put them all in here because you really should go visit it. Uh, there is even an Aeolian organ with 2,289 pipes installed behind curtains in a chamber on the second floor. I don't believe this currently works. Um, but you know, if you are an Edison Ford Winter Estates member um, at the family membership level or above, um, um, you are reciprocal to this site, so you can visit there. The only thing it doesn't um, include is visiting Katazan. It's worth the $10 upgrade to visit it. Currently, uh, you can only visit the first floor. They have um, a QR code that you can scan on your phone, and you can walk through the first floor. When I visited in the past, you were, if you paid, well, if you paid an extra, if you paid 20 at the time, you could get a tour with a docent of Cotizan of two floors. And I know they used to offer other special offerings where they would included, include more than that. Um, and even though you don't get to go on a guided tour right now because they use docents, um, volunteers, and I believe um, um, many of them after the pandemic didn't return, this is well worth the additional cost 
uh, to visit if you're counting on a reciprocal um, membership through NARM. It's, it's worth visiting. I can't emphasize that enough. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Ringling School of Art because it's, it's, it's kind of connected to John Ringling. Um, it's uh, this, the Ringling School of Art and Design began in 1931 as the School of Fine and Applied Art of the John and, Mab uh, John and Mabel Ringling Art Museum, growing out of conversations between John Ringling and the president of Southern College, Lud Spivey, now Florida Southern College in Lakeland. It was established as a branch of, branch of Southern College and then Berman Kimbrough, faculty member and chairman of the music department at Southern became the resident director. During the early years, the organizational structure of the school changed and in 1933, John Ringling approved a plan that severed ties with Southern College and placed the school under the direction of a committee of resident faculty. The new name for the independent school was the Ringling School of Art. The next year's course listings reflected the decision to focus on one academic program. Art, music, and junior college courses were absent. Today, the Ringling Art School is called the Ringling College of Art. And this is where it started at, at the Bay Haven Hotel. They converted it to classrooms and I believe some dormitories as well. In 1927, after the death of Charles in 1926, and one thing I forgot to mention about Charles and his wife um, is that they traveled with the circus a lot more than anybody else by train and she would frequently, uh, Edith would frequently go with them and she was uh, very much a mother figure to the circus performers. And eventually she would assume that role again. Uh, the collapse of Ringling Isles and the real estate market in Florida, John decided to move the circus headquarters to Sarasota. They had been in Hartford, Connecticut. While there were three owners of the circus, Charles's widow, Edith, at that point was not, she had just lost her husband, was not ready to take on a decision-making role. And John's favorite nephew, Alf, his son, Richard, Alf's son Richard was occupied with his Montana ranch. John made the decision alone. And why did he do it? Was it to take the focus off of his waning real estate holdings? Or was it to boost the economy of Sarasota? Or perhaps it was both. Whatever the reason, John Ringling made the decision that would link Ringling, the circus, and Sarasota together. He moved not Hartford, excuse me, from Bridgeport, Connecticut to Sarasota. He moved the winter quarters. And you can see that that image is reversed. But this is about 1950, the winter quarters there. The quarters took up 150 acres of the fairgrounds. It became a major tourist attraction. They would charge 25 cents or uh, something like that. And the money would go into um, charitable things in Sarasota at the time and it remained in Sarasota and, and it was an attraction in and of itself and, until 1959 when it moved to Venice, Florida, which I believe that lasted into the 90s, the 80s or 90s. Um, but it was a very popular attraction that people enjoyed visiting. And one thing I don't say is that the, the circus being in Sarasota, the circus, that left an impact on Sarasota that continues to this day. And by the way, in Baraboo, Wisconsin, you can go visit a circus museum there, the original home of the Ringlings. This gives you an idea of what the setup would have looked like. And that is their gatehouse, another postcard uh, from the Florida Memory Project. And if you visited Ringling, uh, before you go into the building where the missions um, pay your admission, you walk through something, you walk through this. And John's world came crashing down around him. Mabel, his wife, died, died of complications from diabetes and Addison's disease. And Addison's disease is also a disease that President John F. Kennedy had. And I do I think it affects your adrenal glands. And on June 8th, 1929, she died in New York and she was only 54 years old. And Mabel was um, 
the light of John's life <laughs> and a very cultured uh, woman, so self-taught, um, they were a team. A year after the death of his wife, he married a socialite divorcee named Emily Buck, who was much younger than him. He borrowed $50,000 from her four days after their wedding. She didn't like Sarasota. She didn't like him buying art. Newspaper headlines turned against him. Ringling supposedly demanded, and I'm just going to say supposedly, that local reporters bring to him whatever they were working on, they were writing, so he could review it for publication. His health began to fail, first with an infection, then with blood poisoning, then with blood clots that paralyzed parts of his body. He could only smoke one cigar a day, his doctor said, but he smoked it to the nub. And I will come back to this. He files for divorce in 1933. God, does it go through? He filed again in 1934 and it went final in 1936. And in other places, um, I, I have read that it said that she was kind of infers that she was after him for his money, but I, I don't believe that's true just based on the evidence. You know, you have to sort things out. And my answer is probably not. Maybe for the glamour of his life, maybe they fell in love. I don't know. Maybe he was on the rebound, but it seems like she was fairly wealthy and had her own money. So John Ringling's romance went on the rocks here today. And this is from the Tampa uh, Bay Times. I just got, I just put part of this article in here. And out at the palatial home of the circus king who became Florida's outstanding patron of the arts, uh, Mrs. Ringling is reported prostrate from the shock of being served with divorce summons. So was she really didn't like Sarasota because she did stay there and it certainly was a beautiful home. And there too, according to the, uh, to authentic information, Ringling also remains in the seaside Moorish palace, which has become a house divided against itself, which is, a, I think, a, Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. So Ringling is suing his blonde second wife. thought that was interesting. They had to throw that in there. Eppley Hag Buck Ringling for absolute divorce alleging mental cruelty as grounds for action. And by the way, um, other places I had also read that she had been widowed. So I'm not, I can't answer that with 100% certainty as well. News of this action is said to have come as a complete surprise to Mrs. Ringling. Certainly it stunned friends of the couple as the pair had frequently been seen together on long automobile rides. And as far as the public had known, life moved serenely, serenely for the titular head of the biggest show on earth. I think that should say greatest show on earth and comparatively young woman hmm, who became his bride less than three years ago, married December 19th, 1930 in Jersey City, New Jersey. The Ringlings have been prominent leaders in Sarasota's winter social life. For weeks, there have been occasional rifts of a rumor, but these have been vehemently denied by the Ringling's attorney and his confidential secretary who came down from New York several weeks ago to be close to his chief. Late last night, James Kirk, attorney for Ringling in the divorce action admitted the papers have been drawn up and signed and would be on file today. He would not elaborate on the details of the bill of complaint. And so, as I mentioned, they get together, they break up and finally the divorce is final, I think just an educated guess that his broken heart might have led to this. There's also people that certainly think that was true. Uh, one thing about um, John Ringley is he like enjoyed a good cigar. You notice that there and he would switch apparently frequently from hand to hand to smoke it. Uh, one other thing I wanna mention before I go on too far. Well, maybe I can hear uh, before I get any further on this is that it says in a book by, um, John Ringling's great niece, somebody that he never met, but she um, said that he liked to, um, they had dinner parties frequently at Cotizan and one of their celebrated friends that they gave a dinner party for was the Thomas Edison's. 
I question this. I've never seen that anywhere before. I highly doubt that they ran in the same social circles. He was down here in Fort Myers. They were there in Sarasota. Did they overlap at times? I'm sure that their visits did. Uh, did. It's possible they gave them a dinner party. It doesn't sound like something the Edisons would have um, done, gone all the way in those years to when Edison's own health is declining all the way to Sarasota for a dinner party where he's also uh, very, very hard of hearing. But I can't say with absolute certainty, I just doubt it. Um, the other thing I wanted to read was a quote from that book said that said, John Ringling had enormous admiration for Edison. Every time I look at an electric light, he told the NEA News Service, I marvel at what he's done for the world. And this is a painting of John Ringling that hangs in his home by a Russian artist. Uh, the federal court in Tampa had ordered Kadazan to be auctioned off on December 7th, 1936 to pay debts that Ringling owed. John Ringling died in New York on December 2nd. John Ringling North then went to the governor and attorney general of Florida and had the auction canceled. His estate went through legal battles and probate for the next 10 years. And some people said he did have some assets. Maybe they weren't liquid. Um, um, numerous books and videos that I've seen say he had $311 left to his name. But no matter what, it's gonna prevent his Ringling Art Museum from being overtaken. Just a couple more things. The 1951 season was a special one for Sarasota. For about three months, residents and the visitors Sarasota, and this is obviously long after John Ringling is gone, were enthralled by the production of Cecil B. DeMille's Oscar winning The Greatest Show on Earth. It wasn't uh, well known, particularly um, known as a great movie, though it won the uh, Oscar for Best Picture that year, and more than a thousand Sarasotans were paid members of the cast, most as extras who earned 75 cents an hour. I see some names here, Betty Hutton, Charlton Heston. Um, Jamie Stewart is in this as a clown, but he never came to Sarasota. His part was filmed in Hollywood. When John Ringling died in December of 1936, he left his estate to the people of Florida. Do you recognize this gatehouse, by the way? But legal fights with his creditors went on for a decade until the property finally went to the state. During this time, Cotizan remained closed, the home. Finally, in 1946, it was reopened to the public. The house was neglected due to a lack of funds. And by the late 1990s, Cotizan was in such a state of despair, disrepair. It was used as the location for Miss Havisham's decrepit mansion in the 1996 movie remake of Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. And I think that had Gwyneth Paltrow in it. And so they added some, they made it look worse than it actually was with the vegetation, but it was in pretty bad shape, the home itself. I'll talk about this a little more. Um, I've talked a lot, obviously. In 1996, the home was closed, so restoration and conservation project could be undertaken, and so many things had to be replaced and repaired. Even a new roof was installed, and archival photographs were used to determine the original look of each room. Paint samples were uh, utilized to match the original colors of the walls. Original paintings and furnishings were retrieved from storage and restored. The ceiling murals um, by Willie Poganay, the set director of the Zigfield Follies were restored by a group of international conservators. Original moldings were cleaned and repainted. Carpets and rugs were conserved or replaced. Even clothing from the Ringling's wardrobe was returned to the closets and drawers. It was completed in 2002 for 15 million, 10 times that of the original home. And in 2004 and 2005, the home's original gatehouse was restored. You saw that as the entrance of the new visitor pavilion making the welcome visitors receive closer to the original design. In 2019, 
The 70 by 36 white marble swimming pool on the front lawn was restored as a reflecting pool and is absolutely gorgeous. The Spanish style tiles were restored along with the urns and the marble pieces, the focal port of the pool, the beautiful statue of Venus was restored to her former place on the crescent shaped bench. The original sky blue ceramic tiles on the pool's floor were replicated and installed and the reflecting pool was funded by the Bolger Foundation and named on order of Ron McCarthy, who served as a keeper of Katazan curator from 2002 to 2018. Um, just a couple of things. It says 14 Banyan. Um, I talked to our horticulturist, Debbie Hughes, and they put all ficus. I know there's one large Banyan and maybe one or two others that are actually Banyans. One of the stories that you hear, but I couldn't find no backup, though I found it in that few sources, including the Pat Ringling Buck's book was that they came from here, cuttings from our banyan tree. I love the story. I can't prove it's true or not true, but so no proof. But it, it, they are impressive. Uh, go visit. There's also today a circus museum that was added in later years. Pat Ringling Buck says basically something that, um, is it her? I think it's her that said her uncle, a uh, one, family member thought that their uncle would be very upset that there was a circus museum but i feel like this is where he made his fortune it's beautiful they have that miniature circus by uh howard tybels i believe that's based on the ringling uh circus it's amazing there's all kinds of artifacts katazan is beautiful there's beautiful grounds rose gardens mabel ringling's rose garden here um, they changed uh, out the roses. They're not the same ones. Roses aren't designed to last that long, and especially in the summer, they don't look quite the same as in the winter, but it's pretty spectacular. Um, there's a bay, there's all kinds of gardens around the property uh, that you will enjoy seeing. Roses are my favorite flower, and Mabel had a thousand plants and there's many that are the same as what she had and it's an accredited public rose garden which is very unusual that's one of my pictures I looks like I was kind of tilting my camera I've been to Ringling about seven or eight times and that is Katazan the house of John but it's also the house of Mabel because her hand was in that um, this is where his brother Charles ends up He's buried um, here. I think this is in Bradenton, along with his wife and one of his children. And let's talk about this. Um, a, a falling out occurred in the early years between uh, the early years in the 1920s between John Ringling North and uh, his nephews, Henry and John. John Ringling oversaw the circus he and his brothers had built. He was a wealthy man, but the depression and real estate developments brought cash flow pro problems. He disinherited um, Ida's two sons, John Ringling and John Ringling North and Henry Ringling Buddy North. However, John Ringling forgot to any disinherited Ida and. What I have read, and again, it gets so complicated and I am almost out of time, so I'm gonna to try to wrap this up quickly, is that he was kind of never particularly fond, particularly of John Ringling North and he worked for him and he felt like he was trying to do something that wasn't quite kosher. I don't know if that's true or not, but he didn't have a good relationship with them, but he adored um, his sister Ida and her daughter. But when she obviously sides with her sons, that's when the falling out occurred. And they are all disinherited from his will, except I believe Ida gets $5,000. And he didn't specify a final resting place for himself and Mabel, nor um, did he change executors. John Ringling North is the executor of his will. So most of the family assumed that Ida would be buried in Baraboo where the Ringlings are from. And she had purchased a double plot for herself 
and her husband in 1989. So there, they go up to New Jersey in 1989. Relatives learned that Ida's second son, Buddy North, decided she belonged at the Ringling Museum in Sarasota because she had spent a lot of time in the area. So he put her remains into temporary storage in Sarasota when she died and they re until he could figure out how to accomplish that. After his brother, sister, and all his first cousins died, Henry North, um, also known as Buddy North, and declared himself John and Ringling's next legal next of kin and they had the bodies of John and Mabel disinterred. They were in New Jersey and it was always just supposed to be temporary and shipped to Florida, but it wasn't uh, exactly temporary. Then he won permission from the museum's board of trustees to bury all three of them on the grounds of John and Mabel Ringling's Museum of Art in Sarasota. Pat Ringling Buck, Charles Lancaster and another cousin, Mabel Ringling of Mabel Ringling Harrison, uh, said in the spirit of compromise, they were willing to have John and Mabel reburied at the museum because it seemed historically appropriate, though originally they hadn't been a favor of it. And because John had once considered that, but they drew the line at Ida. We're very fond of her, but there's no historical personal reason why she should be there, says Buck, leader of the family group. But I'm going to tell you <laughs> right now, this is John... Mabel and Ida's films. And this is on the grounds of the Ringling Estate. John and Mabel had originally wanted to be buried under the statue of David in the courtyard. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit because they're, the most uh, significant thing that he does is create that John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art. 55 years after his death, Circus King John Ringling has been laid to rest. With him, the family buries a feud that left Ringling's remains in a temporary vault for more than a half century. Ringling, his wife Mabel, and his sister Ida Ringling North were buried after years of family fighting in a private ceremony at the Ringling Museum of Art here. The burial ends Ringling's family fighting over the final resting place and whether the three should be interred together at Sarasota, still the winter home of the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Gailey Circus. I'm gonna kind of summarize this. A state appeals court ended the dispute by upholding a judge's ruling that the three should be buried together on museum's grounds. That's what Henry Ringling North, John's nephew and Ida's son wanted them buried. One side of the family was willing to allow Ringling and his wife to be buried on the property. That, and she had a name that was Mabel and a grand nephew, but they didn't want Ida there because she had nothing to do with the circus. The battle apparently had the roots in the early 1930s, maybe even into the late 20s with the falling out between Ringling's nephews. Ida's sons, Ringling disinherited the pair but did not remove John Ringling North as the executor of his will. And Ringling died of pneumonia in 1936. Uh, I think it was a lot more complicated than that. He had a lot of things going on after a long battle, control of the state went to the nephew. And in 1987, after his brother died, he's next of kin and he has them moved there. And Ida's remains have been stored in a Sarasota funeral home for 40 years. And after John and Mabel are disinterred from Fairview, New Jersey, they were put in crypts in Port Charlotte temporarily again until they are finally buried on the grounds. Um, and if you approach Katazan straight on, not the water view, but the um, front view, and look to your right, there's a, a hidden garden there, they call it. Beyond that are their stones. They're very modest. And it wasn't in the courtyard of the art museum, though they consider the whole property the John and Mabel Ringling use of art. There's that portrait of John Ringling I pointed out to you, and that is um, Ida and her son standing in front of John's portrait. And that came from AP uh, News in June 5th, 1991. And I put, put the whole thing in there so you could see it uh, quickly. Wow, I've talked way too long. He's a, This is the John and Mabel Ringling Museum of art. Uh, it is gorgeous. I tried to do this as a panoramic photo so you could see the statue of David outside. Numerous uh, little carved entryways, many uh, 
entrances to the museum once you've come in the main area, he amassed a large art collection and uh, the largest of Peter Paul Rubens in the US, uh, the Triumph of the Eucharist series, an extraordinary aspect of his acquisitions as they are the only large scale Rubens outside of the US. He had designed a 21 gallery museum modeled on one in Florence. Uh, there's the statue of David, there's more, uh, there's just so much there, so much art. My favorite is a little picture called the Blue Madonna a painting. It's absolutely gorgeous. He also has an extensive art library um, that's there that people um, can look at. You can't check them out. It's open in the afternoons for the public. This collection offers insight into the life and private thoughts of him. Um, they, they weren't collected because they were rare, but because of the content because John Ringling was self-taught and acquired art books and all this art. And he, he acquired an, a massive collection and it gives you insight into what kind of collector he was. John Ringling's Art Museum established Sarasota as a cultural educational center and his way of securing his and Mabel's legacy to Florida. And upon his death, it was bequeathed the entire 66 acre estate to the state of Florida. Cotizan was just like an, not considered the valuable part. It is this at the time, though we know now they're all valuable. And the Museum of Art is now the State Museum of Art of Florida. And it's no longer in the hands of the state of Florida, but in Florida State University, which is made up one of the largest campuses. And there's a view of it from above. And after his death, John Ringling North became the president and director of the circus. And in 1944, after pressures from other members of the Ringling family, control was taken over by his cousin, Robert, who was actually an opera singer and he had taken over his father's bank at another time. But that worst tragedy in uh, circus history takes place in Hartford, Connecticut. When the fire broke out near the top of the big top and in a few minutes over 160 people had died. John Ringling North, which is this is him in 1947 is able to repurchase his share of the Re Ringling and get it out on its feet under a mountain of debt. So he did save the circus. Um, and, in, and by the way, of course, the Museum of Art upon his death went to the state of Florida, now part of Florida State. And now Cotizan, of course, is under uh, the Florida State as well. The whole property is. And in 1967, in 1956, John Renling moved it from under the tent to an indoor circus. And in 1967, after 20 years of leading the greatest show on earth, John Renling North sold it. It was purchased by Irvin Feld. And on Tuesday, June 4th, 8, 1985, in a hotel room in Brussels, Belgium. John Ringling North died of a stroke. There's a picture with him with the blessing of the train as it prepares to head north in 1948. Um, this is some more pictures of the courtyard and the fountain of tortoises, some of the beauty that's uh, there. And this is a significant picture. Ida Ringling North giving the Ringling Estate to the state of Florida, Governor Millard Fillmore Caldwell in Tallahassee in 1946. So no matter what the family falling out, uh, it did end up being preserved as a legacy to John and Mabel Ringling. Unfortunately, Catazan fell in that state of disrepair, but today is an exquisite site. I can't say enough good about it. I have so many sources, I'm listing them all. If you are interested, I can email them and some great books, videos. Um, uh, this is, like I said, this is the one I've ever talked in the longest and the most extensive research I've done on it. This will be on YouTube, uh, most likely not till Friday, but if you go to Digi Edison Ford Digital Discussions, it'll show up there. Uh, there's about 18 or 19 of them there now. Next month, I asked special permission because I used to be a docent at the Chamberlain Museum in Brunswick, Maine. 
And believe it or not, I have a tie in to Thomas Edison, Joshua Chamberlain and the American Civil War, July 12th at 1030. It's a place that I think the world of and little tiny place, nothing like the Ringling, but I think you'll enjoy this. Um, so I am going to uh, stop my share, quickly look and see what I have from for chats. Uh, great job. Whatever you could email and share would be lovely to look at later. This is my email address in case we get shut off. Ask me for it. It's H, um, email me, H Schaefer, S H A F F E R, at edisonford.org. Thank you. I know I am a chatty Kathy. I appreciate it that you watched it. Um, after it's finished, go to YouTube, digital discussions, edisonford.org. I thank you for your kind. Uh, comments. Oh, thanks, Maxine. You you all are awesome. H-S-H-A-F-F-E-R at edisonford.org. Let's see if I can get through this. Is it possible to get this PowerPoint? Um, I would appreciate it. I will try to do that, but if I can't, yeah, let me see if I can get it to you. We'll try to figure out a way. Um, can you email me though? So Because I'm going to lose your question and answer. Elena Cook, Email me hshafer at edison4.org and I will try to get you the PowerPoint, but it is going to appear on YouTube. Guess what? Oh, thank you. This is an amazing place. I thank you guys for your interest. I love this. I appreciate you all so much. And if you saw this, that's right. They send you the hyperlink to it. But if you want to email me, if you have any questions, if you want me to send something to you, let me know. I hope you'll join me next month. Joshua Chamberlain, one of my personal heroes. Um, I can't wait to share his story with you. And uh, John Ringling and Mabel, they amassed a beautiful collection of art and a beautiful home that we get to enjoy today. So they deserve our thanks, as well as the extended Ringling family. Um, that helped preserve it and the people that raised that money to keep this place going. Thank you. I'll see you next month. Bye-bye.